you can uh, keep the saints in Singapore in, in prayer. And I'll mention a little bit uh, tomorrow and Sunday about our ministry otherwise. But one place to rejoice in is Singapore. Okay, so let's open to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And let's have a word of prayer as we begin. Father, we thank you again for the privilege and the joy that it is to gather together. And uh, I pray as we spend this time this weekend that we would rejoice in the truth that you have revealed to us and enjoy the fellowship that we can have with one another. And we thank you in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So as I mentioned, I want to give our time this weekend studying in the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs and the book of Psalms are by far the most popular Old Testament books. One reason you know that is uh, Gideon's and others hand out these little New Testaments, and it'll be a New Testament, and then sometimes they'll have Proverbs and Psalms. And so they're obviously the most popular Old Testament books. Um, but very few who ever refer to the book of Proverbs or quote from it understand 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 you're very familiar with. But it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you'll have a hard, you'll be hard pressed to find anyone who's teaching or quoting from the book of Proverbs who rightly divides the word of truth. And so that's how we want to look at the book uh, this weekend, the way it ought to be looked at, rightly divided. And while we're here in 2 Timothy, also look at chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So also, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, I oftentimes hear people who rightly divide the word truth talk about how they don't, they wonder why are you studying in the Old Testament? Shouldn't we only study Paul's epistles? But it's Paul who says that all of scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So I may not, may not be obvious to me immediately how the book of Leviticus or the book of Proverbs is profitable to me, but I assume always that God knows better than me. So if God says it's profitable, then it's profitable. Amen. And I just need to find that profit. And so we ought to study every book of the Bible, all 66 books. And so again, we're going to give our time to the book of Proverbs. Uh, turn to Luke, and we will actually get the Proverbs sooner or later here. But turn to Luke chapter 24. And as we begin tonight, I want to just kind of put the book of Proverbs in a overall framework as far as how it fits in the Bible. So in Luke chapter 24 and in verse 44, it says, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written, and now notice, in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So Jesus Christ here divides the Old Testament into three groups. There's the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms. The Law, <coughs> Prophets, and Psalms. And uh, so the, the book of Proverbs would fit in this division that would be part of, of Psalms. There are five books in the Old Testament that Jesus Christ, when he divides it here, he calls Psalms. And the, and the book of Proverbs, again, would fit there. And then one other turn to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18. When we talk about rightly dividing the word of truth, there are many divisions and many kinds of divisions in the Bible. So here, here's one example of rightly dividing the word of truth. Don't divide the Old Testament up in the way that the world would or that the Christian world would. Why not divide it the way Jesus Christ divided it? Now here's another in Jeremiah chapter 18. And in verse 18. It says, Then said they, Come and let us devise devices against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priest, 
nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come and let us smite him with the tongue, and let us not give heed to any of his words. So here again we have three divisions, and we have, we have again the law from the priest, and we have the counsel from the wise, and then we have the, the word of the prophet. So in this case, the book of Proverbs would fall here. It's, it's one of the, the books that's counsel from the wise. And again, so there are five books in the Old Testament that here are called counsel from the wise. Um, now I don't, I don't want to spend too much time in this, but sometimes we, you look, people read the Bible and it's just kind of a jumble. They don't, like some people think, why aren't the books all organized when they were written? in the order they were written, but they're not. So they think it's just kind of a jumble. But actually there's a very clear structure to the books in the Bible. And so uh, I'll just, just quickly, in the Old Testament, you have, you begin with 17 history books, and then you end with 17 prophets, and in between the 17 and the 17, you have the, the five books in which the book of Proverbs would fit again, and we'll just call that wisdom. This is the counsel of the wise, so we'll just call that five wisdom books. So you have, you have this 17, 5, 17. Now the, these history books, you can divide, the 17 you can divide into five and 12. So you, you have the, the first five books in the Bible written by Moses are often called the, the Torah, the Pentateuch, and so forth. And then after that you have 12 other history books. The, the prophets, this 17, also you can divide five and 12. You, you first have five what are sometimes called the major prophets and then the 12 minor prophets. Uh, and major and minor doesn't mean important and not important. It just means the major prophets wrote lengthy books and the minor prophets wrote shorter books. So you have that division. And then um, this, um, make sure my math is correct here. This is getting beyond me mathematically. <laughs> These 12 history books divide into nine and three. These nine books are all concerning the history before the Babylonian exile and these three after the Babylonian exile. And these 12 books and prophets divide the same way, nine and three. So the first nine prophets are prophesying before the exile and the last three after the exile. So that's just uh, just an example of how there's a definite structure to all the books. And again, the book of Proverbs fits in here. Um, turn to the book of Proverbs now. The, the, word, the word proverb <coughs> comes from uh, the first part of the word pro, P-R-O, stands, it means for, F-O-R, for. And then the last part, verba, verb, means words. So literally the word proverb means four words. And the idea is four words are instead of words. Meaning that you're going to, instead of giving a long detailed explanation of something, you're just, instead of many words, you're just going to say it in a very short, concise manner. And so that's, that's what a proverb is, is saying something in a very short, concise way. We, uh, we have many, as every culture does, we have many proverbs. Uh, we have haste makes, makes waste, or uh, Benjamin Franklin, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise, and many of those kind of proverbs. 
allergies, or you must have caught this from Brian. <laughs> um, and so that, that's basically what a proverb is. Uh, in chapter 1, verse 1, it says, A proverb of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. So the, the author we can see right away here is Solomon, the Proverbs of Solomon. This is the first book in the Old Testament to begin by identifying the author. So if you start in Genesis, Exodus, and go through, this is the first book you come to in the Old Testament that, again, right at the beginning, identifies the author. If you look quick over at chapter 10, and uh, you'll see, the, again, the Proverbs of Solomon. And then chapter 25, and verse 1, he says, these are the Proverbs of Solomon. Notice in chapter 25, verse 1, he says, These are the Proverbs of Solomon, or also the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. So we know from uh, in, in, the, in Kings that Solomon wrote thousands of Proverbs, but not all of them are given by inspiration of God. So only those given by inspiration of God are, are in this book. Um, while we're in the neighborhood, turn to chapter 30 in the book of Proverbs. And a couple of things I want to quickly note here. Chapter 30 and verse 1, he says, The words of Agar, the son of Jacob, even the prophecy, the man spake unto Ithiel, even unto Ithiel of Ubi. So chapter 30, it says, These are the words of Agar. Uh, we don't really know who that is. It's, nothing else said about him in the Bible, but these are his Proverbs. And the other thing I want to note while we're here in chapter 30, verse 1, notice it says, even the prophecy. And one of the main things I want to emphasize this weekend as we talk about the book of Proverbs is that this is a prophetic book. So most of the time when you hear people reading or quoting the book of Proverbs, they will they'll grab verses out that they think will help us to know how to live wisely in our day-to-day -day life. And, and there, there certainly is some of that in the book of Proverbs. But what very few will understand is that this is a prophetic book. And one way we know that is it says that right here in this verse. And then as we later go back to chapter 1 and start going through, you'll, you'll see that very clearly. And then also look at chapter 31 and verse 1. It says, The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. So this chapter, these are the words of King Lemuel. Some, some say that that's another name for Solomon, but we can't prove that. Maybe, maybe not. But again, notice in chapter 31, verse 1, this is prophecy. So, when, when we study the book of Proverbs, we have to understand that, again, this is a book of prophecy. That, of course, it's not talking about the Church of Body of Christ. The Church of Body of Christ didn't exist for long after this. It's not talking to Gentiles, and it's not talking about this dispensation of grace, but it's concerning Israel living under the law, seeking a kingdom on earth, and, again, it's a book of prophecy. And it, it especially, in its prophecy, looks toward the time of Israel's great tribulation. And, and again, as we look at some verses, uh, especially later in chapter 1, we'll see that very clearly. All right, so again, uh, Proverbs chapter 1. And let's just, uh, mo most of this will go through fairly quickly, but starting again in chapter 1 and verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. So again, the author is Solomon. We know he's the son of David, and he's, he's king. And that's very important in understanding the book of Proverbs, is that this is a king writing these Proverbs. And again, he's a king of Israel, so it concerns Israel. Then, in verse, beginning in verse 2, the next few verses are going to tell us the purpose of the book of Proverbs. So verse 2, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. So the, the first purpose listed here in verse 2 is to know wisdom 
and instruction. Wisdom has to do, there's, you know, there's knowledge where you know information, but then there's wisdom in knowing how to use that information in daily life. So the book of Proverbs is to know wisdom and instruction. Um, the, the word wisdom, if you study that word in detail, it, it's as I just said, but it also carries the idea of having something pounded into you. So the idea with the word wisdom, it's not something that we just pick up naturally and simply. But it's something, again, that we have to have pounded into us. So that's why when you read, if you read through the whole book of Proverbs, there's several things that, several ideas you'll see repeated several times. In fact, sometimes it's the same wording repeated again and again. That's because if you want to get wisdom, you have, we have to have this pounded into us. And, and we all know if we've been children or had children or taught children, most important things you can't tell a child one time. You have to repeat it again and again and again. You have to pound it into them. And so that idea is found in, in, the, in the meaning of the word wisdom. Um, and then the word instruction, he says to know wisdom and instruction. The, the word, when you study the meaning of the word instruction, that also has that idea of having it pounded into you. You have to repeat it again and again. But it has an additional idea that it has to be pounded into you with discipline. And again, we all know if we've been parents or school teachers or something, that not only do you have to teach things again and again and again, but you have to have discipline. If, if your classroom or your home is just chaos and they're not paying attention, they're never going to get it. So you have to have discipline. And that, that idea is again, again carried in the word instruction. Now the NIV in verse 2 says, the beginning of the verse says, for attaining wisdom and discipline. So in chapter 1, verse 2, the NIV says, the first purpose, it says, for the book of Proverbs is for attaining wisdom and discipline. Now, the word wisdom is fine, to know wisdom, but they change the word instruction to discipline. But the goal here in the book of Proverbs is not discipline. The goal is instruction. Now, you need discipline to have instruction, but the goal is not discipline, it's instruction. So that's one of many blunders in the NIV, uh, in, their in their translation of the book of Proverbs. All right, then verse 2 continues, to perceive the words of understanding. So that's the next purpose, to perceive the words of understanding. So the, the book of Proverbs is written so that we will be able to perceive the difference between vain, the vain words of man's wisdom and the understanding that God gives. We're going to come right back here. We'll turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1. Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, and verse 18, says, For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. It's important to, that you understand when you read Ecclesiastes 1.18. He says, for in much wisdom is much grief. He's talking about the wisdom of the world. If you spend your life accumulating the wisdom of the world, you'll find ultimately it's grief. And the same thing he says, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. He's talking about the knowledge of the world. How many people are there that we know and have heard of that are extremely knowledgeable in the things of the world and they end up depressed and suicidal and so forth? Because the knowledge of the world increases, the more that increases, the more sorrow increases. But, and you can turn back to Proverbs chapter 1, but that's not the case with God's wisdom and with the knowledge that God gives. That, increase, that, that brings joy and peace. 
And so, again in verse 2, to perceive the words of understanding. Now, the word, the word understanding, if you study the meaning of that word, it again carries that idea of having something pounded into you. Understanding doesn't just come simply, naturally, quickly. It has to be pounded into us. Again, things have to be repeated again and again. But the word understanding carries an additional idea of authority. That you, you have to have an aspect of authority to get understanding. Now, of course, in what we're talking about in the book of Proverbs, you have to recognize the authority of God. <coughs> the authority of the Word of God, or you will never get understanding. Mm -hmm. And the same thing if you're a parent or a teacher. If, if the, the student or the child has no respect for your authority, they won't gain understanding. Right. So that, that aspect has to be there to get understanding. Um, the, uh, by the way, each of these words that we've talked about in verse 2, wisdom, instruction, understanding, are found more often in the book of Proverbs than in any other book in the Bible. So if you want to study about wisdom, instruction, understanding, this is a book you would have to study. All right, then go on to verse 3. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. So he gives some further purposes here for the book of Proverbs. First, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. So, the, the book of Proverbs is designed to give us good sense in discerning, uh, we've talked about wisdom already, but then justice. Being able to tell the difference between what is just and what is unjust. What is righteous and what is unrighteous. And when you look at the world around us today, and you talk about a lack of understanding of what's just and what's unjust, and the book of Proverbs is designed to teach us that. And then also judgment. So it's to teach us to be able to, to judge between what is right, what is wrong, what is good, but what is better. Uh, one of the key words in the book of Proverbs is better. This is better than that. And so to teach us judgment. And then finally in verse 3, equity. And equity, it's kind of like the word equal. So if you just remember that, the word equity is having the ability to, to compare things and discern if they're equal or if this one is better or if this one is better. So that's the idea of equity. And the book of Proverbs is designed to teach us that. Um, in verse 3, the NIV translates this verse as follows. It says, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, doing what is right and just and fair. So that's quite different from the King James, and I'm not going to comment on every single difference there. But one difference again, the, at the end of the verse, the NIV, NIV says, doing what is right and just and fair. The King James says to receive justice and judgment and equity. But the NIV is doing what is right and just and fair. And, and I want to emphasize that because when you compare the King James Version with the NIV and other versions, there not only are there thousands and thousands of differences, but when you begin to carefully compare, you notice there are certain patterns that keep showing up. And one of them is, I could spend a whole weekend and, and more just showing you verses where the NIV changes the verse. And if, if you compare the King James and the NIV, the King James will emphasize God, and the NIV changes it to put the emphasis on man. And the King James will emphasize faith, and in this case, um, the qualities, justice, judgment, equity, but rather than faith, the NIV will change it and emphasize works, emphasize what man does. So that's what they do in verse 3. The book of Proverbs in verse 3, one of the purposes is that we the readers might receive 
justice, judgment, equity. This means it gives us some knowledge, some understanding, some wisdom, so we can discern things, what's good, what's bad, what's better, and so forth. That's the King James. The NIV is, the book of Proverbs is designed so that we will do what is right and so forth. And you'll see that pattern again and again and again if you compare the translations. Okay, then verse 4. Um, he's still talking about the purpose of the book of Proverbs. To give some tilty to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. So another purpose, to give some tilty to the simple. To the young man, knowledge and discretion. So the, the book of Proverbs, it's a safeguard against being misled. Again, the, the dispensational time frame of the book of Proverbs is primarily that time of great tribulation. When Jesus says that it will be a time of great deception, many false Christs, and so forth. So the book of Proverbs is a safeguard to not be misled, not, not to be gullible and just believe anything that you hear. Um, notice in verse 4, it speaks about the simple, the simple, to give some tilty to the simple. Now it's important in the book of Proverbs to understand that does not mean simple-minded or dumb, unintelligent, stupid. That, that's not the meaning of the word simple in the book of Proverbs. The word simple in the book of Proverbs means really two things. One is that you're gullible, naive, easily influenced. So when false teachers come along, you're easily influenced to believe what they say. It doesn't mean you're, you're not intelligent. There are a lot of extremely intelligent people that are misled into all kinds of wrong teachings. And then the other thing with the, the, the word simple in the book of Proverbs is that when you study the simple in this book, Again, it's not an intellectual problem, but it's, it's a moral, spiritual problem. Okay, and then he says uh, in verse 4, to, to give to the young man knowledge and discretion. So knowledge is basically just information. And the book of Proverbs will give us information. Okay, then verse 5. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. So in verse 4, it's the simple that gain from the book of Proverbs. But in verse 5, it's not only the simple that benefit from the book of Proverbs. Because a wise man will hear and will increase learning. So the wise man also will benefit. Uh, turn again, we're going to come back, come right back all evening. We turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. So, if someone thinks, well, I'm not simple, I'm, I'm wise, well, you can also learn, even if you're wise, you can learn from the book of Proverbs. <clears throat> Mark chapter 4, and beginning in verse 24. And he, Jesus, said unto them, Take heed what ye hear, with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. For he that hath, to him shall be given. And he that hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he hath. So the book of Proverbs is also, it's not only written for those that don't have that wisdom. It's also written to those who already have wisdom, and they're going to be given more wisdom. In fact, they will gain more than the simple will studying the book of Proverbs. So those that have are going to gain much more. All right, again, back to Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 6. To understand the proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. So it's to, the, this book is written to understand a proverb. As we study through this book, it will teach us how to understand the proverb and the interpretation. And then it says, uh, the words of the wise, Solomon and the others who wrote the proverbs here, and their dark sayings. Now that, 
That phrase, dark sayings, in verse 6 is, is interesting and important. Because that the word dark sayings, the Hebrew word means literally means to be tied up in knots. Now that's that helps a lot with the book of Proverbs because there are many many Christians, and I've heard many preachers say, talk about the parables. They say that Jesus taught in parables to make the truth simple. So even the common people can understand the parables. The Pharisees didn't understand them. And Jesus said when the disciples asked Jesus, why are you speaking to them in parables? Jesus said so that they won't understand. The, when the when preachers say Jesus taught in parables to make the truth simple, that's completely wrong. Absolutely the opposite of the truth. Jesus taught in parables so that they, the Pharisees would, and religious leaders would not understand. And even the disciples didn't understand. So he had to get alone with them later privately and explain the parables to them. Parables are very difficult. If you think they're simple, then you're, you don't get it. They're very difficult. The same thing is true with Proverbs. Again, a lot of people think Proverbs are very simple, little, short, simple little sayings that we can easily, quickly get the truth. That's absolutely wrong. If you think that Proverbs are simple, then you don't get it, because they're very difficult. So again, that, that phrase, dark sayings in verse 6, literally means tied in knots. So a proverb, it's like a riddle or a knot. You have to gradually unravel the knot or, or figure out the riddle. It's not, a, it's not an easy book to understand. Well, there are some easy things, but there are a lot of very difficult things in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is not intended to be simple. Um, the, in looking again in verse 6, the NIV translates that verse, for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. But this isn't talking about parables. This book is about proverbs, not parables. So the NIV is completely messed up there, not understanding what is a proverb and what is a parable. All right, then verse 7, and uh, this is probably the, the key verse in the book of Proverbs. If, if you're only going to know one verse in the book of Proverbs, and I hope you'll know more than that, but if you're only going to know one verse in the book of Proverbs, this would be the verse you should probably know. Chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of of knowledge, and then turn over for a moment to Job, book of Job, chapter 28. Job chapter 28, and verse 28. And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and it is wisdom. So I said chapter 1, verse 7 in Proverbs is really the key verse in the book of Proverbs. Really, you could say it's the key to all of these books, all five of these books. That it's, if you want wisdom, if you want knowledge, if you want understanding, it has to begin with the fear of the Lord. Now, since the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, it's very important that we understand what does the word fear mean. Because according to verse 7, if you don't have the fear of the Lord, you're not even at the starting point. So you, you, we better understand what does that mean, the fear of the Lord. Uh, you can find endless commentaries and, and sermons where the preacher will explain, in, in this verse and many other verses in the King James Bible, they will explain that the word fear doesn't mean to be afraid or to be scared. It means reverence. And they, they will go on and on talking about how we're, we're not supposed to fear God, we're not supposed to be afraid of God, be scared of God. We're supposed to have reverence for God. 
And many translations will change the word fear to reverence and so forth. So, it, is that true? Well, notice again, uh, well, tur turn to the book of, um, go back, well, tur turn to Hebrews chapter 12. We'll just save some time. And uh, this will... So cut right to the chase. Hebrews chapter 12. If we could look at several verses, but again, this just gets right to the point. Hebrews chapter 12, and notice verse 28. Whereby we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably, acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So in the King James Bible, does fear mean reverence? No. This verse talks about reverence <coughs> and fear. They're not the same thing. They may be related to one another, but they're not the same thing. So in the King James Bible, when it when you find the word fear, as in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, what does the word fear mean? It means fear. Yeah. It doesn't mean reverence or respect or whatever. It means fear. And, and clearly, the Israelites, when they read the book of Proverbs, that certainly would be their understanding of fear. For example, look back in the book of Exodus chapter 20. Early in their history, the Israelites had some experience with the word fear. Exodus chapter 20, and beginning in verse 18. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces that ye sin not. So here you have the thundering, the lightning, the noise, the trumpet, the mountain smoking. Do you think at that moment these Israelites had reverence or fear? Pretty sure they had fear. They probably didn't even have a lot of reverent thoughts going on at that time. They had fear. And that's what the word means in the King James Bible. Every time you see the word, it never means anything other than fear. All right, go back again to the book of Proverbs chapter 1. So that is the beginning of knowledge. Fear. The fear of the Lord. Now what, what about, the, before we continue in Proverbs, turn to Romans chapter 3. What about in the dispensation of grace? We don't live in the dispensation of fear. We live in the dispensation of grace. Romans chapter 3. So, is it proper for us today to talk about uh, having the fear of the Lord, fearing God? In Romans chapter 3, Paul gives a description of mankind and what, what is wrong with mankind. So chapter 3, he begins in verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God, and so forth. And so he goes through giving a very unflattering picture of mankind. And then notice verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So in the dispensation of grace also, it is true that the fear of the Lord, fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. If you don't have that fear of God, you won't even, you're not even at the starting point, including the dispensation of grace, uh, as far as gaining, no gaining knowledge and wisdom. Um, turn to Luke, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11 and verse 52. Jesus says, Woe unto you, lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and then that, and then that, sorry, them that were entering in, ye hindered. 
So Jesus says, Woe unto you, lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. So that means those under their instruction are not getting knowledge because they've taken away the key of knowledge. Well, what is the key of knowledge? Fear, Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So in any dispensation, when people begin to lose their, the fear of the Lord, lose that fear of God, they lose knowledge also. In fact, they don't even begin to gain the knowledge because that's the beginning of the knowledge. Um, go back uh, then to the book of Proverbs, chapter 1. Okay, again, chapter 1 and verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. By the way, notice, it doesn't say the fear of the Lord is the end. It's only the beginning. Some people talk about the fear of the Lord as though that's the ultimate. That, you know, once you have the fear of the Lord, you've got it. No, that's just the starting point, the beginning, not the end. And then he goes on in verse 7, and he says, But fools despise wisdom and instruction. The book of Proverbs has a great deal to say about fools, or the fool. In fact, the word fool is found more often in the book of Proverbs than in any other book in the Bible. Well, that's good to know for a couple of reasons. One is that you should have a goal to not be a fool. I don't want to be a fool, and I would hope that you have that same goal for your life. So if you want to know, if you want to be able to look in the mirror and see, am I a fool? The book of Proverbs will help you to know what is a fool and to figure out if you are one of them. And the second thing is, even if I'm not a fool, or if you're not a fool, I want to have the ability to discern if you're a fool. I want to be able to tell when I meet you, are you wise or are you a fool? So again, how am, I gonna, how am I going to know if you're a fool if I don't really know what a fool is? The book of Proverbs will help us to know what, what is a fool. Um, so in, in Proverbs chapter 7, a few things right away that we learn about a fool. And there are many things later in the book, but right away in verse 7, we see that the fool does not have the fear of the Lord. So that's a good thing for us to know. When we meet somebody that clearly does not have the fear of the Lord, we know we just met a fool. Secondly, in verse 7, the fool does not possess knowledge. And of course, we're not talking about the knowledge of the world, but God's knowledge. Thirdly, the fool despises wisdom. It's not just that he doesn't have wisdom, but he despises wisdom. Number four, the fool despises instruction. So here's already in verse 7, now we know four things about a fool that we can begin to figure out. Am I a fool or are you a fool? Uh, turn to Psalm 14, and there, there's much more in the book of Proverbs and, and in some other places in the Bible where you can come up with a very clear, specific idea of what is a fool. So you know one when you see one. Psalm 14 and verse 1 is another verse that will add to our knowledge about this. It says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. So here we learn that the fool says there is no God. So that's five things we learned already about a fool. Number six, we see in this verse the fool is corrupt. And number seven, the fool does abominable works. And number eight, the fool does not do good. So, just like that, in a few seconds here, we've already learned eight things about a fool. Then turn to uh, Luke. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. A number of years ago, I was preaching in India. And I, I enjoy people asking me questions. And, and I'm fine with people challenging me because if I can't support 
what I'm saying from the Word of God, then nobody should believe it. So I don't have any problem with that. But uh, I had a young man who, who was challenging me, and clearly it, it became evident that he was not willing to believe the Word of God. And, and I, I was getting nowhere with him. So finally I said, you know, this is in a group of people, I said, the problem is that you are a fool. And they were, you know, they, they couldn't believe this white guy is coming over there speaking to a group of Indians and saying, you are a fool. And I said, I don't know why you all act so surprised. If you want to, sh I can show you from the Bible what a fool is. And then you tell me, is he a fool? And they got the point quickly. But there are people who are fools. And, and we need to discern who those, who those people are. And, and if I'm one, if you're one. Um, so another verse that will help us, Luke chapter 24. Um, chapter 24 and verse 25. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So here's another thing we learn about fools. The fool is slow to believe the word of God. So, in just a few seconds, there's nine things that we learn about a fool. There's many more, but just with those nine things, if you didn't know these nine things when you came in, when you walk out tonight, you should have much more ability to discern if you meet a fool out there. Um, before we go back to Proverbs, look at Romans chapter 1. Now, do fools walk around saying, I'm a fool? Romans chapter 1 and verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So fools don't go around saying, I'm a fool, or wearing a sign that says, I'm a fool. Quite the opposite. The fools think that they're wise. They profess themselves to be wise. And that's why we need to have some ability to discern. Are they truly wise or are they fools? Okay, then again back to Proverbs chapter 1. And verse 22. And verse 8. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Verse 8 begins the first of several lessons that the father is going to teach to my son. And so the first lesson in verse 8, again, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Um, the, the NIV in verse 8 says, Do not forsake your mother's teaching. But it's talking about the, the law. They were living under the law. It's not just teaching, it's the law. Also, there, there's a lot we can talk about here that we're going to just skip over or go through quickly. But in verse 8, notice that it's the father's responsibility to give the instruction and the mother's responsibility to lay down the law. So don't forsake the law of thy mother. All right, then verse 9. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. So the instruction of thy father and the law of the mother will be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. So the first lesson that the father wants to teach the son here is basically to honor and obey your mother and your father. Then verse 10. My son of sinners entice thee, consent not. So this begins the second lesson to my son. If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. The way of sinners, of course, is very attractive for young, young, immature children. Uh, I, I know we, we ended up homeschooling our children, but I, I could tell almost from the day he was born, my oldest son had a real attraction to the boys who were troublemakers, because he liked to laugh and you know, do 
do stuff that he shouldn't do. And so if, if he was in a school where he had a bunch of those kind of boys, or even a couple, he would have been attracted to them, and we would have constantly had to deal with that. And that's not unusual. Children are naturally attracted to that sort of thing. And so it's necessary if sinners entice the consent thou not. Uh, verse 11. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood, let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. So the sinners will entice you, saying, come with us. And not only children, but as adults, we face this. We're bombarded all the time, whether it's the, the sins of the flesh or the sins of religion. We're constantly hearing it, come with us, come with us. So we have to learn to refuse that invitation. There's a, there's a certain excitement to, you notice verse 11 is quite a violent verse, but there's a certain excitement to violence. A lot of people these days are asking, how can it be that ISIS is attracting all these young men and even young women to go join them? And, and even from, from Europe and America, where they have good lives, comfortable, pleasant lives, and yet they're going over and joining that, that bloody, violent, vicious group. Well, if you understand the book of Proverbs and other passages in the Bible, you understand that's man's nature. There, there's a certain excitement and attraction to that sort of thing. And ISIS knows that. So they put all these <coughs> gruesome videos on the internet and so forth, and they know that many of us can't even bear to watch that kind of stuff. And if we did, we'd be repulsed by it. But they also know that there are a number of people that will see that and they'll find that exciting and want to join them. And so that's the kind of thing verse 11 is dealing with. Now, prophetically, as I said, the book of Proverbs is a prophetic book. Prophetically, verse 11 is speaking about two things those who shed the blood of Christ, and also those who will persecute the saints during that time of great tribulation. The ones in verse 11 who say, come with us, those are the ones that killed Jesus Christ. And those are the ones who will persecute the saints during that time of great tribulation. Notice verse 11 again, come with us, let us lay wait for blood, let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Who is primarily the innocent? Jesus Christ. And notice they're lurking privately, secretly, privily to get the innocent without cause. Look at John chapter 15. The Gospel of John chapter 15. And verse 25. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled, that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. That is exactly what the book of Proverbs prophesied. That when the innocent comes, they're going to seek, they're going to hate him and seek to kill him without a cause. And then back again to the book of Proverbs. <clears throat> Chapter 1 and verse 12. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole, as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. All right, so when the in, we know when the innocent comes, they are going to seek to kill him without cause, meaning there's no justification. He didn't do anything to them that would merit that they should kill him. They don't have any good cause to kill him. But why are they killing him? What's their motive in killing him? Verse 13, we shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. So as I mentioned, one of the attractions to join, when they say come with us to join with them, is just the excitement of the flesh. But here's another motivation in, thir in verse 13. To find all precious substance and fill our houses with spoil. Turn over 
to Matthew, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 21. When you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you read about the Pharisees and how they want to kill Jesus, they have these meetings where they get together and they, they're making plans to try to kill Jesus. And, and ultimately they're successful in doing so. Why do they want to kill him? Well, a major reason, if you look in, in Matthew chapter 21, and if you look at verse 33, it says, here another parable. So here's a parable. We're not going to read through the whole parable, but let's just pick it up in verse 37. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him. So when the son, when the heir shows up, they want to kill him. And why do they want to kill him? And let us seize on his inheritance. That's why the Pharisees wanted to kill him. Because they want his inheritance. They, they want that precious substance. And, uh, verse 39, And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. Okay, again, back to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 13 is prophetic of those Pharisees. That's exactly what they did and why they did it. Chapter 1 and verse 14. Cast in thy lot among us, let us all have one purse. So that one of the ways the sinners try to entice you is they promise we will share the spoil equally. When we get this precious substance, you can be sure you'll get your share. Cast in thy lot among us, let us all have one purse. So this is the second lesson to my son. Now, if the nation of Israel would have paid attention to this second lesson in Proverbs chapter 1, given to my son, they would not have killed Jesus Christ. They would have understood what's, what's going on and why it's wrong. So here's some, just, we're, we've just begun in the book of Proverbs, and here's some wisdom that had they understood it and heeded it, they would not have crucified Jesus Christ. But they're fools. Okay, then, um, continuing chapter 1 and verse 15. My son, walk not thou in the way with them, refrain thy foot from their path. <laughs> verse 15 begins the third lesson to my son. And he continues, verse 16, For their feet run to evil, and make haste to shed blood. The, the book of Proverbs is quoted eight times in the New Testament. This is the first verse in the book of Proverbs that's quoted in the New Testament. And turn to the book of Romans chapter 3 once again. We read a little earlier from Romans. And in Romans chapter 3, Paul is going to quote from this verse in Proverbs. Romans chapter 3, and we read earlier verse 10, verse 11, and then we read verse 18. So let's start in verse 13, chapter 3, verse 13. Their throat is an open sepulcher, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. So Paul here quotes Proverbs chapter 1, verse 16. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. This passage here in Romans 3, verses 10 through 18, is a, a tremendously important passage. Because I grew up all my life, when I was a kid, I don't, I don't know if I heard any saying more often from adults than, I believe that men are basically good, that people are basically good. That's how I believe that. And then I read here in Romans chapter 3. And I can't tell you how much this helped me in life. You have people constantly just stunned and they just, they can't believe that somebody would do something like that. If you read Romans chapter 3, you'll believe that people do stuff like that. You won't find all that so shocking. Okay, back.
back to the book of Proverbs. So that, uh, their, their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed blood. Chapter 1, verse 17. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. Now verse 17 is, is an interesting verse. What does that mean? Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. And you'll find commentators give opposite meanings to that. Some commentators say that the, the meaning of verse 17 is that even though you spread the net right in plain sight, the bird will be so stupid it'll fly into it anyway. So they say that's what verse 17 is saying. But some say the opposite of that. Some say that verse 17 is saying that it's useless to spread a net in the sight of the bird because if it sees a net, it'll fly around it. So they have completely opposite meanings. So I think it means the latter. I think, first of all, if you look at the wording carefully, surely in vain the net is spread. So who is the one doing the vain thing here? It's the one spreading the net. It's spreading it in vain. Why? Because it's in the sight of any bird. So the bird can see the net. It's not going to fly into it. Um, and then, then if you go on, and then what's, what's the meaning of, of it in the context? If you go on then to verse 18, and they lay wait for their own blood, they lurk privily for their own lives. So the point I believe if you take verse 17 and 18 together is it's saying, if you spread a net in the plain sight of a bird, the bird will see the net and it'll fly around it. But these sinners, here in Proverbs chapter 1, the ones that killed Jesus Christ, they are so stupid that they set their own trap. The bird is smart enough to fly around the net. But these guys are so stupid, they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. And of course, that's the, the, the ultimate result, is that these fools and the, they're the ones that get death. They thought if they killed Jesus Christ, they'd get the inheritance, get the precious substance, but they're the ones that are going to end up getting the death. Okay, then uh, chapter 1 and verse 19. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. If you study carefully about the Pharisees, one of the main things that you will see about the Pharisees again and again and again is they're greedy of gain. So when we think, well, what was wrong with the Pharisees? Why are they bad guys? And why do they want to kill Jesus Christ? They're greedy of gain. They want that inheritance. Okay, then verse 20. <clears throat> Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. Notice in verse 20, that wisdom is personified. In other words, wisdom is spoken of here as though wisdom is a person. Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. Three times in the book of Proverbs, wisdom is personified. This is the first time. If you study these three, and before the weekend's over, we'll look briefly at, at all three, if you study these three times in the book of Proverbs where wisdom is personified, you will find out it prophesies the three phases of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. From the book of Proverbs, if, you, if we didn't even have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the New Testament, but we understood what Proverbs is talking about, just from the book of Proverbs, we could figure out when Jesus Christ comes, what he will do, what he will teach, where, where he will teach, what the response will be of those who hear him, and much more. We can figure out just from the book of Proverbs. So um, I want to get through a few more verses, and I only want to go a few more minutes, so I'm going to try to go quickly here. But again, verse 20, Wisdom crieth out, she uttereth her voice in the streets. Um, the one thing I need to deal with before I carry on here, in case some of you are thinking, you might think, 
Why in the world would it refer to Jesus Christ as she and her? And the reason for that is there are two prominent women in the Book of Prophets. There's the strange woman, and we'll talk about her tomorrow. And so this woman is in contrast to the strange woman. This is the, the wisdom woman. But, uh, but when it speaks here about wisdom as a person, that's speaking of Jesus Christ. Uh, look, just a couple verses quick, look at Luke chapter 11. And there, there's a bunch of verses we could look at here, we'll just look at two. Luke chapter 11 and verse 49. Therefore also said the wisdom of God. So here the wisdom of God speaks. Who, who is this that says this? It's Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ here is the wisdom of God speaking. And then one more in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And verse 24. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So who is the wisdom of God? Christ. As I said, there's a bunch of other verses we could look at. But it's very clear in the Bible that Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God in a person. All right, now back to Proverbs chapter 1. So Proverbs chapter 1, beginning in verse 10, verse 20, tells us about the first phase or the first stage of the ministry of Jesus Christ. So when Jesus Christ comes on the scene and begins his ministry, what's the first thing he's going to do? Well, verse 20 says, wisdom crieth without. That means outside of the city. Did Jesus Christ begin his ministry in Jerusalem? No. He was without the city. She uttereth her voice in the streets. And if we had more time, we could look at cross-references for all these things where um, in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they say to Jesus Christ, you have taught us in the streets. That's just what verse 20 said he would do. She crieth in the chief place of concourse. In the openings of the gates, in the city she uttereth her words, say. So the point in verse 20 and 21, the main point is, when Jesus Christ begins his ministry, he's going to preach in open public places. You know, a lot of cults and, and even some religions or faiths where they have more truth begin in, in a very quiet, sometimes even secretive manner. Jesus Christ is not going to begin in that way. He's going to speak in open public places to multitudes of people. When you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what do you find? When Jesus Christ begins his ministry, this is just what he does. In fact, they say to him later, they say, you have taught us openly. Okay, then what, what is he going to say? So now we know where he's going to preach. What is he going to preach? Verse 22. How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Notice in verse 22, there are three different categories of people. You have the simple ones, you have the scorners, you have the fools. This again is how Jesus Christ encountered the Israelites. So first of all, you have the simple ones. And if you remember what we said earlier about the simple ones, when you read in the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can find passages where it talks about how they watched him. They listened to him and they watched him. They were observing him. So at that point, many of them are not negative. Some of them are quite positive, but mostly they're just listening, watching, observing. So at that point, they're simple ones. Then, then you have the scorners. As you continue reading in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, suddenly you start finding verses where it says they mocked him. They laughed at him with scorn. So they're no longer simple ones. Now they become scorners. And then you have the fools who hate knowledge. That's when you come to the last part of the ministry of Jesus Christ. They're not anymore simple ones. They're not even scorners anymore. Now they're fools. They hate knowledge and they crucify.
crucify him. Now, again, what is he going to preach? Verse 23, turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. So when he comes, what is he going to preach? It says, he will say, turn you at my reproof. When Jesus Christ began to preach, what did he preach? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent means turn. Turn you at my reproof. And then he says, if you do that, I will pour out my spirit unto you. Now, some of them in Israel did repent. Some of them did turn at his reproof. And what did he tell them, his disciples? He said, I'll send my spirit. And he did, in Acts chapter 2. And I will make, my, make known my words unto you. He, we could look at many examples where he made known his words to his disciples. As I mentioned, he explained the parables to them. Later he gave revelation to Peter, John, James. He made his words known. So verse 23 just one little verse tell you this is what Jesus Christ is going to preach when he comes and that's exactly what we find um, verse 24 so this is the first time verses 20 through 23 give a great deal of information about the first of the three stages of Jesus Christ's ministry what he will say where he will say it and so forth All right, verse 24 because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear come. I often use verse 26 as an example of the importance of rightly dividing the word of truth. God says, I will laugh at your calamity. Is God up in heaven this evening? looking down at all of us and at your neighbors and so forth, and he sees all the troubles we're having, physical, financial, you know, relationships, all kinds of, and he's sitting up there laughing. Because if you take the book of Proverbs the way many do today, where you just take a verse here, a verse here, and you apply it to this dispensation, isn't that what that verse would mean then? That God's sitting up in heaven laughing at our troubles? But when you understand that this is prophetic of that time of great tribulation, he, I, I've often heard people say, does God have a sense of humor? Well, there's a few ways that, that I think that question can be answered. But one way that question can be answered is that there are several verses in the Bible where it says God laughs. But the, every single time in the Bible when God laughs, he's laughing in derision. He's mocking. You can't find anywhere in the Bible where God laughs because, you know, why did the chicken cross the road? Or somebody tells a funny joke. He, you never see him laughing at a funny joke. Every time he laughs, it's a mocking, derisive laughter. That doesn't make God seem like such a nice guy, does it? That's not really the picture that the evangelical world wants us to give, give us of God. But here's the verse, and we could look at several others, where God laughs in derision. But what you need to understand is there's only one time when God laughs. Did God ever laugh in, in all those Old Testament years, hundreds and hundreds of years, did God ever laugh? Not once. Now here, we're reading in the Old Testament about God laughing, but this is prophetic. I will laugh. He's not laughing when this book is written. Never in the Old Testament did God laugh. <coughs> did God ever laugh at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John when Jesus was on earth? Not once. Is there anywhere in the Bible where it says God laughs during this dispensation of grace? Not once. The only time in the Bible that God laughs is during that time of great tribulation. And the next thing that's important to understand is who is he laughing at? And what the book of Proverbs will teach us is he's laughing at the Antichrist and his followers. That's the only ones that God, the only time God ever laughs is during that great tribulation, and he's laughing at the Antichrist and his followers who think that they can over.
overthrow him and take the kingdom and get the inheritance. That's the laughter in verse 26. Now, if you begin in verse 26 and you start taking note of some words like calamity, fear, and then you go on to verse 27, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. If you look at verse 26 and 27 and emphasize the words that I just emphasized, and then look at those words in the Bible, you will find out those are great tribulation words. Over and over and over, when you find passages talking about that time of great tribulation, you will find these words. Calamity, desolation, fear, distress, anguish, and so forth. So again, if we had more time, I could show you a bunch of verses. But when you look at verse 26 and 27, you read that. If you're relatively knowledgeable of the Word of God, you should immediately think, this is the great tribulation that's being spoken of here. And then verse 28, Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. But they will seek me early. Oh, sorry, they shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Now, is that how God always operates? In, in every dispensation, that you can call upon God, but he won't answer? No, that's not, that's not how God operates consistently through history. He's talking about this particular time of that great tribulation. That's, that's the time in Israel when they will call upon him, but he will not answer. They will seek him, but they will not find him. And why is that? For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. When Jesus Christ returns, they will eat of the fruit of their own way. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity, and notice that word prosperity, of fools shall destroy them. That's what the Pharisees want. That's what those who follow the Antichrist will want. They want prosperity. Why do most people in Israel take the mark of the beast? Because they want prosperity. And they think that's where it's at. But they're fools, and it's, it will destroy them. And then I'll conclude tonight, verse 33. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. So those who are those who get the wisdom, the instruction, the knowledge, all those things that we saw, the purpose of the book of Proverbs, they're not going to be destroyed. They're going to dwell safely and will be quiet from fear of evil. You think back in the book of Exodus, remember when God sent the plague of boils upon the cattle in Egypt and cattle were dying in the fields, but not in the land of Goshen where the Israelites were, not one died. And then came the plague of the hail and the thunder and the lightning, and all through the fields, the, the animals and the crops and the people who were out there were being slaughtered, destroyed, but not where the Israelites were, not one hailstone fell. And so that's a picture of what God will do during that time of great tribulation. He's going, the, those who have the fear of the Lord, those who trust him, they're going to dwell in safety as all of this is taking place. All right, thank you very much uh, for tonight. I've been plenty long. I've